Hello, time for the mini lecture. Okay. First topic I want to talk about is one that I have had, I skipped for a couple of days now. And this time I wrote down what I want to talk about. And the first thing is nested loops, namely loops inside of loops. So here we have a loop that's a for loop that goes counting x from 1 to 10. And inside of it is one that has y from 1 to 10. Inside that loop, we multiply x times y and then print it out. And this goes all the way through. And then we print a new line. Then we return to the outer loop where x becomes 2. And then we start again with the inner loop. You know what I think we need to do here? I think we need to go to the Java Visualizer. So let's go to Java Visualizer here. And let's pop this in here. And let's get rid of the scanner because we don't need it. And let's see what this is actually doing. So here we go. X starts as 1. 1 is less than or equal to 10. So we now go into our inner loop where Y becomes 1. 1 is less than 10. So we print out 1 times 1, which is 1 here. And then we'll go forward. Now y is 2. 2 is less than or equal to 10. We print 1 times 2, which is 2. And I'm going to keep going through this here. y is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And 9 is less than or equal to 10. Now y becomes 10. 10 is less than or equal to 10. Therefore, we do the multiplication, 1 times 10, and print that out, which prints out a 10. Now y becomes an 11. Remember, even though we know the loop is done, Java still does the action. So now y is an 11. And 11 is not less than or equal to 10, which dumps us out of the inner loop. And now we go to the next line. Now we come back up here. x was 1, and now we do the action and x becomes a 2. Now we go into the inner loop again. We start y back at 1. 1 is less than or equal to 10, which, we, which means we are now going to do 2 times 1 and print that out, which gives us a 2. y moves up to 2. 2 is less than or equal to 10. 2 times 2 is 4, and we print that out. y is 3. 3 is less than or equal to 10, 2 times 3 is 6, and so on. And let's move that up again here. So y becomes 9, 9 is less than or equal to 10. We print 2 times 9. 10 is less than or equal to 10. We print 2 times 10. y moves up to 11. 11 is not less than 10, which means we go out of that loop print the new line to go to our next line. And now we are back to our top loop where x is um, 2 and it moves up to 3. 3 is less than or equal to 10. And we go through this again. So that's how a nested loop works. And in fact, if we were to compile this and run it, you would see we get the multiplication tables from 1 to 10. Um, yeah, I'm going to do something here. Let's try this. Um, say this as triangle of stars dot Java. So what we want to do here, and let me rename it right away. So enter an, an integer and print that many lines of stars to make a triangular pattern. For example, if the number is four, we print 
one star on the first line, two stars on the second line, three stars on the third line, and four stars on the fourth line. Now, one of the things that they did in this program is they used X and Y as their loop variables. And you'll often see people using the, inter, the, the variable names I and J for the inner and outer and inner loops. I like to have a little bit more meaningful variable so that the code becomes clear. So first of all, we need to enter a number of lines. And we're going to have um, integer n lines becomes input.nextint. So if the number of lines is, well, we don't even need an, an if statement there. Now what we're gonna do is for int line is zero, line less than the number of lines, line plus plus. So our outer loop is gonna draw one line at a time. Our inner loop is gonna draw stars. We'll set stars is zero. Stars is less than the line number. So on line zero, we're going to print one star, zero, and then zero, one, zero, one, two, and zero, one, two, three. I think I'm gonna need a less than or equal to line. Let's check here, when I have line zero, Star start is zero, and I want less than or equal. Otherwise, I won't draw. I'll, I'll be one short. And then stars plus plus. I'll print one star. When I'm done printing the stars for that line, I do a system dot out dot print line. And let's see. Let's compile that. And let's see if that works properly. So I say four lines. And sure enough, there's my four lines of stars, my triangle of stars. If I say I want 15 lines, I get that pattern. So that's another um, use of nested loops. Admittedly, it's not a useful one, but it's an interesting one. And again, notice that I am, by the way, what would have happened if I had said stars less than line? Let's think what would have happened. Line would have been zero. Stars would have been zero. Is zero less than zero? No, it is not, which means we would have never gotten that first star on the line. And then we would have gone to the next line. And in fact, that's exactly what would happen if I said I want four lines, I'd be one star short on every line. Now, I could have also said stars less than line plus one. Or I could have said stars less than or equal to line because zero is less than or equal to zero. I would have printed the one star. Stars would have become one, but one is not less than or equal to zero, and I would have dropped out. And there, now it's fixed again. Okay, so that's nested loops. Um, on to strings. And I think I'm gonna use J shell for this. So remember I have a string S here. And um, let's see, well, let's do something here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And we had methods like length. And that would give us back the length of the string. Now, there are a lot of other um, things that we can do. One of them, let's set S to something different. I'm going to put four blanks, a tab, a couple more blanks, A, B, C, D, E, F. And then I'll put a couple more tabs. And a few more blanks there. And now there's a the method called trim. I can say string no leading or trailing. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Wrong, wrong, wrong case. No leading trailing blanks is s.trim. 
And what that will do is it'll trim off any leading white space, blanks, new lines, and tabs. And I get just the A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, notice that I had multiple blanks in between A, B, C, and D, E, F. Trim does not trim them down to a single blank. It leaves those alone. It only gets rid of the initial blanks at the beginning and then ending blanks, and those get cut away. Let's put... Um, I can have shout becomes s dot to uppercase. If I have a string called, um, well, let's call it a um, message. I can say string whisper is message two dot two lowercase. So the two lowercase takes everything that's a letter and reduces it to lowercase. And this is sort of handy to have. Now, two very, very important methods that strings can do are the index of and the substring method. Oh, I forgot to make my notes file. Keep forgetting to do that. So let's say I have a string A, B, C, comma, space, D, E, F. And I'm going to number the indexes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. And let's say that this is in a string called str. If I say str.index of comma, that will tell me where the first comma is in this string. It'll give me back a 3. In fact, let's go back here and we'll put it in gh. Eight, nine, eight, nine, zero. And here's uh, 10, 11, and 12. If I say string dot last index of comma, that will give me the eight. If I have the string banana and I say string dot index of a n, you can go for more than one letter, that will give me back a one. If I say string dot index last index of a n, that will give me back a three. Let's test this to make sure that's correct. Um, can I turn on a terminal here? No, I can't. Okay. So let's go here and say string. String equals A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And I say string dot index of comma gives me a three. Last index of comma. gives me an eight. And then let's say string fruit becomes a banana. And I say fruit dot index of an gives me a one fruit dot index, uh, last index of, excuse me. Gives me a three, just as I predicted. Now, what if I try something like string dot index of um, DFD, that's not in the string anywhere. 
And so what it gives me back is a negative one. What if I say fruit.index of letter B is going to give me a zero? So negative one means not found. There's also the substring method, which is again, a very important one. So let's have a string here and I'm going to um, set to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. And then I'm going to number these so we can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 1. Okay, that's um, 10 and 11. If I say string dot substring, the generic form is I give it the from and to positions. And that gives me the portion of the string starting at the from position up to, but not including the to position. You know what? Instead of from and to, which is a bad name, Let's call it start and end. Well, it starts at the start position. Duh. Okay. So let's try this and see in J shell what that gives us. So if I say string is going to be um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. And I say string dot substring from let's say two to seven. And let's look at this here so we can see this at the same time. So it's just give us starting at C up to, but not including H. So it should give us C, D, E, F, G. And let's try that. And sure enough, it gives us CFDEFG. If I say stir dot substring from zero to two, that'll give us the first two letters, which are AB. Now there's another flavor of substring. If I say stir dot substring seven, it goes from seven to the end of the string. It's exactly the same, by the way, as saying sure dot substring of seven to um, stir dot length up to, but not including the length of the string. That would give us the same thing. But it's sometimes so common to have this last thing here that this shortcut is very handy. Um, something very important to note. Index of returns a number, not a string. Substring returns a string. All, and this, this is really important. All of the string methods leave the original string untouched. For example, let's look at str. If I say str.2 uppercase, that gives me a brand new string with everything translated to uppercase. If I look at what's in str, it hasn't changed, which means when I use things like two uppercase or two lowercase or substring or trim, I have to assign it to a new variable. I have to say string upper string, it becomes str.2 uppercase. Now I have upper string and str, and they are separate from each other. So all of the string methods always, always, always give you some new string or some number, and they always leave the original string untouched.
Um, there's a fancy phrase for that, namely, strings are immutable. All the method calls that you do on a string will leave the original string exactly the way you had it before. Okay, now let's use um, index 7 substring to do something sort of interesting here. So we're going to go here and let's open up our template file. And let's save this as citystatezip.java. For this program is we're going to ask the user to enter a string in the form city comma state and zip code and then split it up into its constituent parts. In fact, let's repeatedly ask the user to enter the string in the form. And we'll call this city state zip. So here we have string address. And we'll set to the empty string and we'll have a do while loop. And then we'll have address becomes uh, input.next line. <laughs> I almost said next int, which would definitely not have worked. And then if the address, well, is not equal to the empty string, then we'll process it. And we'll do that as long as the address is not equal to the empty string. You know what we might want to do here, by the way? Let's do address becomes address dot trim. We can reassign a variable. In fact, let's go back here really quickly. I could have said, for example, string becomes string dot to uppercase. And that will change string because now I'm reassigning it. But the two uppercase itself doesn't do anything. It's the reassignment that changed it. Yeah. So in case the user presses a space bar before they enter their stuff, I wanted to trim everything off. And let's just check to make sure that this works here. Let's say um, great. Of course, if I say blah, that's going to not, not valid, and we're going to have to worry about that a bit later. And let's just print enter to quit. Now the question is, how do we split this up? Uh, here's the trick that we're going to use. Let's plan this out a little bit. Okay, consider this. I have city name, comma, and then my two-letter abbreviation, and then 99999. So what I really want to do is I want to find the first comma. The next thing I want to do is I want to find the last space. That means everything before the comma is the city. Everything between the comma and the last blank is the state name. And everything after the last space is the zip code. So I can use index of and last index of to make my 
life rather interesting here. So let's go and look at this. So we're going to have here an integer comma position is going to be address dot index of comma. We're going to have a last blank position is going to be address dot last index of space. Now, if the comma position is greater than or equal to zero and the last blank position is greater than or equal to zero, that means we at least have a comma and a blank. Otherwise, we can say, I don't recognize that address format. So we have to have both a comma position and a last blank in there. And we probably also want the last blank to be after the comma. Because if the last blank is before the comma, that would mean things are getting pretty weird. We'd have the last blank here. If I left off the zip code, yeah, everything, everything would, it would, it would come out pretty weird. So I need one more condition. And the last blank position has to be greater than the comma position. Notice, by the way, I've split this on the two separate lines because if I had put it all on one line, that line would have gotten awfully long. So I'll indent it just a little bit. Now I can split out my parts. I can say string um, city is going to be address dot substring starting at zero up to, but not including the comma. My state is going to be the address substring starting at the comma position plus one because I have to move past the comma. And I'm going to end at um, last blank position up to, but not including that. And then finally, hmm, okay, my indenting is a little bit off here and I'm not sure why. Oh, it's because I did this crazy thing here. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Well, let's move everything so that it aligns properly. Yeah. And then my zip code is going to be address.substring from last blank position plus one to the end of the string. Now, the problem is what happens if somebody types in something weird? Um, oops. Like for example, Cupertino comma, California, comma, 95014. I want to get rid of all those extra blanks. Can you leave? Okay. And there's no blank. Sorry, there's no comma there. Okay. All right. So I'm going to say city becomes city.trim. State becomes state.trim. And zip becomes zip.trim. Then I can print them out. Let's compile that and let's see what we've got here. 
So if I have Cupertino, California, 95014, that worked pretty well. Um, how about, let's say, um, Carson City, Nevada. And I have no idea what the zip code is, so I'm just going to make something up. In fact, oh, let's put in some extra blanks here. Oops. Uh, can I use the back arrow? No, I can't use my back arrow here. Okay. Well, let's try this. So let's put some spaces in here. Um, and there we go. And yeah, I know, I know, I know. Let's put a blank line in there for readability. There, I feel happier now. So. Great. Well, actually we could say San Jose. So that's pretty neat. The fact that we can use index of, last index of, and substring to take a user string and split it apart into units that we can manipulate later on individually. That, I believe, finishes up what I want to talk about with Chapter 6. So um, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow in terms of the mini lecture, but I'm sure I will think of something. See you all then.